The Bob Murphy Show, episode 147. you gonna do get ready for another episode of the bob murphy show the podcast promoting free markets free minds and grateful souls it's your source for commentary and interviews conducted by a christian and economist now here's your host bob murphy hey everyone welcome to another episode of the bob murphy show this episode, I'm going to be interviewing Richard Ebling. And Richard, it's I have a special place in my heart for him because he was my undergraduate professor when I went to Hillsdale College. So let me go ahead and read his official credentials. Richard M. Ebling is an AIER senior fellow who is currently the BB&T Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. And he's also was at one time, the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE. And as I alluded to, he also, for many years, was a professor at Hillsdale College, where I uh, interacted with him. And so this is a fun interview. I'm glad that this happened. This was not planned. I didn't give him advance warning. You'll see that I asked Richard at some point in the interview his thoughts on a particular economist. And it's not like Richard just knows, oh, yeah, the, you know, what, what was the big contribution that that guy's known for? He goes through and tells you the whole guy's career just off the top of his head. And like I say, that wasn't planned, but that's, I'm glad that that happened because that's the the trait that I remember most about him is he would just come into class with no notes and just go and, you know, know all sorts of biographical details about the person. And uh, and it was awesome. And I think I didn't get to these anecdotes. So let me just mention them now just to see what kind of professor he was that, um, one, so this was, I was at Hillsdale, let me see, from 94 to 98 as a student. And so at one point in there, there was like the, the government shutdown. I guess it was like, you know, when the new Gingrich Republicans were going against Bill Clinton, if I'm getting my right. Yeah, timeline right. Um, and so he, <laughs> Evelyn comes in to class and he's literally dancing. And everyone's like, what's going on? And he said, because the government shut down, there's a government shutdown. And he was just dancing around. And then another day when it was the time of the, you know, during the, it was a history of economic thought class where he was supposed to, to lecture on Keynes. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he said something along the lines of that he wants to dance on his grave. So there you go. So he was a very colorful professor and uh, you'll see that in this interview. Oops, one last thought, folks. Um, it just occurred to me as soon as I hit stop on the, on the recording there. It might actually have been Marx that Evelyn said he wanted to dance on his grave. I can't remember. It was either Keynes or Marx. And, and the reason was, it wasn't just like, he wasn't saying, oh, because the legacy of his bad ideas, he's saying that the guy in his personal life was not a nice guy. And, and so that's unfortunate. We ran out of time in this interview. I wanted to ask Richard that to say, hey, besides the fact that, you know, we're not big fans of Marxism around here, tell us a little bit about Karl Marx and his personal life and like how he treated, you know, the workers around him and that sort of thing. Because that, I, re- I remember that lecture that day was uh, pretty eye-opening. So unfortunately, like I said, we, we ran out of time and I couldn't get him to tell those stories. But again, that's the kind of guy he was that he could go off for 10 minutes just sharing personal stories about, you know, anecdotes about the person that we were studying that class in the history of economic thought. So it was really a really good time. All right. Now, here is the interview. Well, Richard, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. It's great to be with you. So I'm going to, of course, get into your background as if you were any other type of guest who's an expert in Austrian economics. But I just do want to mention two anecdotes because you, of course, taught a lot of my classes when I went to Hillsdale College. And uh, I remember, so my advisor was Chuck Van Eaton one of the semester. It was near the end and I had to, you know, I was getting a major in economics, obviously. And just the way it worked out is he said, now, Robert, you're going to be taking three classes with uh, Professor Ebling and you're going to love every one of them. And he was right. I did. <laughs> so that was just like all ebbling all the time that particular semester. And, uh, and another one I remember is, I, did you teach comparative economic systems? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would so, have done that too at yeah, some point. Yeah. So it was that class and you had us reading. It was like 
the I don't know if it was from the Black Book of Common, but it was something like oh. going over not merely, you know, socialism is inefficient in terms of allocate, but like, do you know how many people were murdered by communists in the 20th century? It was one of those deals. And I remember I caught you in the hall and I had been reading, and I was like, I don't understand though, like why did Stalin still keep some people, you know, who were his enemy? And you just said to me, he said, well, you can't kill everybody. <laughs> and I just kind of filed that away as like a maxim of life that Richard Evelyn said, you can't kill everybody. And so... So anyway, I, you probably didn't realize that that was some words of wisdom that I that I absorbed from you in that during that time. Okay, but let, 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 let's hope that's a working hypothesis yeah. when things become worse in America. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so the way I normally do these things with somebody that I'm sure the people in the audience know a lot about is just to say, you know, how how did you get here? Like, what's your your superhero origin story? Like, when you were younger, at what point did you get interested in these ideas? Well, actually, my interest in uh, freedom ideas and Austrian economics began the day I was born. How's the that? doctor picked me up by my little feet, slapped my tiny bottom, and I shouted out. And at that moment, I realized, man, acts. But I also <laughs> realized that he had slapped my little butt without my consent. And this was a violation of the 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 uh, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, non-aggression axiom. And so at that moment, I was both an Austrian economist and an advocate of liberty. Uh, 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 okay, maybe not, maybe not. Okay, actually, I got interested in these ideas uh, when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I know I look well-preserved, but uh, I am 70 years old. And uh, so I was a teenager in the 1960s. And to, to make a long story very short, I met two gen gentlemen who introduced me to the writings of Ayn Rand. So as mm -hmm. the phrase goes, it usually begins with Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. uh, I read her first her nonfiction, then her novels. That's when the Nathaniel Brandon Institute was still operating. I attended uh, uh, you know, tape lectures that they offered around the country. I was living in Hollywood, California at the time. And uh, they would have a bookshelf of books that Ayn Rand recommended. So I picked, started picking up a bunch of them. Henry Hazlitt, Ludwig von Mises, Bum Bavark, uh, William Graham Sumner, Herbert Spencer, um, and a litany of others, uh, Frederick Bastia. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, that's what got me into thinking seriously both about economics and from a free market point of view. So when I was a teenager in high school, I was reading all this stuff on my own. And it was a rude awakening when I got to college. And the first econ course I took had as the assigned textbook Paul Samuelson's Economics, the seventh mm. edition, 1967 edition. And I realized that this was not quite the same economics that I had been reading on my own. Mm -hmm. So that was a rude awakening. You mean this, that, that, that Western economics is the economics, but, uh, but that's how it began. So by the time, when I was in high school, I knew that I was interested in liberty and I was reading and getting interested in Austrian economics. So majoring in economics and going on with the economics, it was just sort of a logical progression for me. Huh. Well, that's interesting. So you're saying Ayn Rand herself or the like the Nathaniel Brand Institute actually uh, mentioned Bumbavark as one of the things to go read? Yes. You see what it is, is that you'd go to these tape lectures. They would have them about once every other week. Mm -hmm. well, they would have representatives around the country, NBI representatives. And they would, uh, you'd sign up for it, there was a fee, and you could listen to tape lectures by Ayn Rand, uh, Nathaniel Brandon, Barbara Brandon, Leonard Peikoff and others that were taped live at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute in New York City when they were housed in uh, the basement of the Empire State Building, or I suppose that they would like to call it the foundation of capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, so, so these were the taped lectures and about halfway through the lecture, uh, they take a break, you know, go to the restroom, get a cup of coffee. And there was a bookshelf there. And these were books uh, recommended by, and actually some of them purchasable through Nathaniel Brandon Institute. And these were the kind of books and also history books like Arthur E. Kirch's The Decline of American Liberalism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, a book by Robert Hessen. I mean, th those are the types of things. So, and plus these ones that I mentioned. And that's how I got hooked on this. And then shortly after that, in a way I don't, not sure I remember how, I, I came across The Freeman, the magazine, mm -hmm. The Freeman published by FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. And uh, I somehow started communicating 
with Bettina Biengraves, who was a senior staff member there and was a person who knew all things Mises from mm -hmm. the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was then living in Northern California starting college. And I, I again, I'm, to make, a long, to make a long story short, I knew people who knew Baldy Harper, Floyd Harper, the founder of the Institute for Humane Studies, when they were headquartered out in Menlo Park, California. And so I was introduced to Baldy and people around him who were helping him run H IHS. Now, Baldy died soon after that. But then in 1974, uh, IHS sponsored the first Austrian economics conference in June of 1974 in South Royalton, Vermont, where the lectures were delivered by Israel Kirzner, Murray Rothbard, and Ludwig Lachman. And there were about 40 odd people in attendance, uh, graduate students mostly, I was still an undergraduate. Uh, and many of these became leading lights of the Austrian school. Uh, Gerald O'Driscoll, uh, Roger Garrison, uh, Suda Shinoy, Mario Rizzo, Joe Salerno, uh, the, you know, the, the, all the usual suspects were there, right, right. but just young gra graduate students. So, you, so, so that was a catalyst for what really was the emergence and growth of a new generation of the Austrian mm -hmm. school that otherwise might not have come into existence. Um, and then the, I told Bettina that I was attending this conference in Vermont and she wrote back to me, of course, this was all back in the days of snail mail, right. that uh, by coincidence, the week after the Austrian conference is being held, there was being one of Fee's week-long summer seminars at the foundation grounds in the old mansion that they used to have in Irvington on Hudson, New York. Mm -hmm. So I went from the Austrian conference to uh, the foundation in Irvington and had a week there. And uh, those lectures were by people like Hans Senholz, Henry Hazlitt, and of course the, the staff members of Fee, including the president, Leonard Reed. Mm -hmm. And both of those weeks were, were very memorable. Well, so I'm glad you brought up, well, before I get into that stuff, I just wanted to ask, I didn't realize you mentioned, so the Nathaniel Brandon Institute would have things around the country and people would show up and just listen to taped audio recordings of lectures that Ayn Rand get, had been giving? Yes, Ayn Rand, Nathaniel Brandon, uh -huh. Barbara Brandon. Uh, I think they had a history series by Robert Hessen, uh, Leonard Peikoff on philosophy, she was a young philosopher who's become a major member of the objectivist movement in later years. Uh, and I suppose it must have been others, but th those were the hard core people on, on their circle who, who gave these lectures live at the Nathaniel Brandon Institute in New York. Mm -hmm. And then on the old fashioned reel to reel tape machines, you would go and pay a fee to hear them around the country. And I was in one in Hollywood, okay. California now, listening to now this. Now was that because they didn't like tour? Like did Ayn Rand not go to major cities and give public lectures or did she do that also, but this was also how to leverage it? She, 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 she did travel. I mean, she, she did her almost annual Fordham University lecture. Mm -hmm. at, at one point, she was also attending a gold bug seminar in New Orleans. I forget the name of it, but it was well known back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, uh, and she, so she would do that. But those are like special invitations like to a university. Right, right. But she gave one, uh, 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 she gave a commencement address at, uh, at uh, West Point one time, for instance. But the Nathaniel Brandon Institute was an educational organization that every week had at least one or two lecture programs mm -hmm. and you could go and attend them live. They also had social evenings. I met Ayn Rand. Oh, okay. Uh, it, was, it was in early 1968. They had a Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon had a breakup, which we won't go into. But that, but by the end of 1968, there was no more Nathaniel Brandon Institute. Mm -hmm. But I was 18. I was visiting New York from California to visit with my grandmother during the Christmas and New Year's vacation. I wasn't going to miss a ch chance to go to the NBI. And they had a social evening. This was in early January. They had an, a social evening. And uh, Ayn Rand was there. And uh, she was dressed in a, a red denim railway men's like outfit, like a railway conductor with a little conductor's cap. And her husband, Frank O'Connor was there with her. And he was, uh, for those who are the older people who will remember these things, he wore a Nehru suit with beads. The meaning of any of this, I never found out, but it was a social night. They actually were dancing, uh, you know, rational objectivist dancing, obviously. And, uh, I'm so bad. 
Anyway, so, and she actually uh, very graciously stood around for about a half hour or more with a small group of us in which you had a chance to talk with her. Um, and, uh, you, know, you know, people, viewers are, you know, fanatical, dogmatic. I found her calm, deliberative, open. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the descriptions of her that she has, you know, dark eyes and she would like look right at you, either hearing your question or giving her answer, her, her eyes would not waver. That's absolutely true. But, but she, she, she was a, a, an extremely logical mind who had thought about this a lot from her perspective. So that when you asked her a question, it's obviously a question she had heard a million times. So she knew how she wanted mm -hmm. to answer it. But there was a calm, deliberative certitude that did not in any way seem offensive or, 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 or in the pejorative sense, dogmatic. Right. So it's, 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 I found her a very impressive person. I, I'm curious though, on that, like did anybody challenge her or were they all questions like, now what did you mean on page 52 when you said this? Well, if you went to the Daniel Brandon Institute, you probably viewed yourself as, uh, as they used to call it, a student of objectivism. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it would have been people already sympathetic to her philosophy. Right. You know, it is so long ago, I don't even remember the questions mm -hmm. or her responses. Uh, because we're talking about, well, 1968. That's right, right. Uh, but but I can say that that my in, I can still see her in my mind's eye. I can still see her in the circle with us, and and that, that's my impressions of her as a persona. Right. Okay. Great. So I was going to ask you about the uh, South Royalton Conference. So I'm glad you brought that up. So that's I mean to us that sounds like you know our parents talking about going to Woodstock or something. So how? <laughs> so can you just e explain a little bit more on the significance of that? And then also yes. again, like how how did you personally like well, why were you there and, and that sort of thing? Like how right. did you how did you get entrance into it? Well, let, let me sort of put this in historical context. As some of your viewers and listeners may know, the Austrian school was an unbelievably prominent school of economic thought through the last decades of the 19th century and practically the first half of the 20th century. Certainly through the 1930s and then into the 1940s. But in the 1940s, uh, two things happened in the economics profession and uh, particularly in the world of policy, um, both outgrowths of the Great Depression. And that was the, the rise of socialism in the West. I mean, there was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917. But, but this idea, the 1930s, the, the experience of the Great Depression, then war planning during the Second World War, th there was a sense that, that you know, planning seemed to work in wartime the socialists are right, we can plan a better economy that won't have great depressions. Uh, the only thing is that we'll make it democratic socialism as opposed to that sort of rough around the edges Stalinist version. He, mm. he, he seems to kill people, but, <laughs> but the idea of planning and making everybody happy is good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so we would have forms of, of government planning. Now, and and complementary to that, out of the 1930s came uh, Keynes's book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which became the Bible for Keynesian economics. So by the, the end of the war, you had these two, two conceptions of, of, of a planned society, government, monetary, and fiscal intervention a la Keynes, and then a, a more no, noticeable one with, with socialist parties uh, in uh, the European continent or the Labour Party in Great Britain, which actually was nationalizing industries after they they won election in, in, in July of 1945 and out went Winston Churchill. Uh, and then in the United States, uh, there was never a, a successful Democrat, a, a, a socialist party, but the Democratic Party always had these leanings of more redistribution, the need for an activist monetary and fiscal policy, um, uh, government paternalism through various regulations. And, and that was the environment. And in that setting, the Austrian school virtually died away. Uh, when I first met Ludwig Lachmann at that Austrian conference, Bob, yep. uh, and we would go for like some little walks around the town square. It, it's a really small village town, but in the center of the, of the square was uh, a Union soldier, you know, a monument to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he would say, he, 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 uh, he, he said to me, he had this gravelly voice, oh, Mr. Evelyn. I am quite gratified by this conference. For many years, I had thought I would be the last Austrian economist in the world. 
Uh, because uh, Hayek had shifted into social philosophy mm-hmm. uh, by the 1950s, culminating in his book, The Constitution of Liberty in 1960, and then his blood legislation, Liberty, in the 1970s. Mises had migrated to the United States during the war, ended up with a visiting longtime position at NYU in the School of Business, mm-hmm. but was basically ignored by the uh, profession. Uh, and Ludwig Lachmann, as one other that was interested in these ideas, um, ha- was teaching at the University of Weidwaterstrand in South Africa and still was publishing things, particularly on capital theory, mm-hmm. but had no high profile. So in a sense, in terms of the major figures, the Austrian school had, was dying. Right. Uh, but the fortuitous circumstance that through Mises at NYU, two people were attracted to him and inspired by him and became major catalysts, helping to lead to that Austrian conference. And that, of course, was Israel Kersner, who actually did his dissertation under Mises uh, at NYU, uh, which became his book, The uh, Economic Point of View, mm-hmm. and Murray Rothbard, who, um, who got his degree at Columbia University in New York, but was for a long time regularly attending Mises' seminars, evening seminars at NYU. Uh, and they too became, they picked up the tradition and were publishing books in the 1970s, A Reawakening of an Austrian Tradition, which then attracted the Institute of Humane Studies to then want to, when a fortuitous seemed, circumstance seemed to be there, to have this conference. Little did we know, this was June of 1974, uh, in terms of the attendees, Bob, little did we know that in October, Friedrich Hayek would be awarded the Nobel Prize in economics, which of course gave international notice and therefore helped raise a rebirth of the Austrian school. But about the conference itself. Can can I just ask you, because I actually was going to ask you literally that question. Were you guys shocked when that happened? Or was it like, yeah, it's about time? Or I guess both could be true. I, you know, I would imagine that virtually everyone was 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 bowled over. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the Nobel Prize had only been given since 1969, if I remember correctly, and uh, up to that time, it was basically you know all the mainstream economists you'd expect. Mm-hmm. Paul Samuelson had won it. And others, I'm blanking on out who those early winners were. I think were. Kenneth Arrow was one earlier. Yeah, winner. and uh, and well, wasn't Tinbergen got it as well? Maybe Tinbergen might have been the first one to get it. I don't remember. You, know, you find that on the internet. But anyway, so um, none of us expected. Not, now you'll notice that that uh, it was a joint award, Friedrich Hayek uh, and Gunnar Myrdal, who was a very famous Swedish economist. Now, um, the, the stories I've heard, I don't know if they're apocryphal or not, was that the Swedish Academy actually wanted to honor Gunnar Myrdal, but he was a socialist from a small country. It seemed like they were like giving something to their own rights, because it's a Swedish right. Nobel Award. Uh, so they figured that they had to counterbalance it with maybe another small country and someone ideologically different, so that therefore Hayek won it. Now, Fritz Machlop actually wrote the prospectus for the Nobel Committee, uh, which was later published, explaining his importance and his contributions. Uh, but but the interesting thing is, is that now it's it's like, uh, you know, what, 40 odd years later, almost 50 years later, I guess, 45, whatever, it's 46. And uh, everybody who's interested in this knows that Friedrich Hayek won the Nobel Prize in 1974. Who the hell remembers Gunnar Myrdal? Right. Right. So, so, so that's it's nobody expected it, and it had this 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 effect of creating a renewed, helping to create the the national and the international catalyst for a profile, a reprofile for Austrian economics. Just as fortuitously, IHS had had this conference. Mm-hmm. Just so one more tr- thing on that, if you don't mind. So, yeah. I've heard. Do you think there's anything to the fact that because it is kind of an odd, I don't know if coincidence is the word, but Mises dies in '73. And then Hayek wins in 74, whereas if Mises had been alive, they couldn't possibly have given the award to Hayek and not to Mises. And so I've you heard know, people I, say, oh, I, they knew I, that I, they deserved it, but I they weren't going to give it to him. That's an easy conjecture. Uh-huh. But even if Mises lived for another couple of years, and obviously at that age could not have gone himself to receive the award, because they don't give the Nobel posthumously. Um, I would have been very surprised if he had, had been the nominee. Uh, I can I can see me Hayek for a various series. He, he was more 
how can I put this? Mises was viewed as dogmatic and intransigent. Mm -hmm. He didn't suffer fools gladly. Right. Uh, a lot of people disliked him both as a persona and his ideas. Uh, Hayek, uh, his long years at the London School of Economics, his association at the University of Chicago, uh, he had a different personality. Uh, in his own way, he was as principled as Mises in what he believed in. Uh, but he had a different personality. He always assumed the benefit of the doubt for his mm -hmm. intellectual opponents. Uh, if you if if you recall, who did he dedicate the road to serfdom? His one of the most famous books to uh, the socialists of yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. I assume that you have good intentions and you want to improve the conditions of humanity. I just want to point out to you that you've chosen the wrong means mm -hmm. to that honorable end that we all share. Uh, now. Mises at one level would, would have said the same thing, but he, he was more crusty about it. So, uh, can, can I, I just clarify sure that? I just want to make sure the, the, so the claim is I'm not endorsing it is that the, agreeing with you, they saying, yes, there's no way in the world they were going to give it to Mises, right. but they had to wait till he was dead because they couldn't give Hayek an award partly for his work on business cycle theory, which was Mises theory that he elaborated. So that that's the claim that it's not uh, a coincidence well, that Hayek you, couldn't get it until Mises was safely dead. That's the idea. Well, that that would have been it would that I'm sure that there, even if you get into the minutes mm -hmm. of the Nobel Committee, that would have never been said directly. Right. It, it might have been something in people's attitudes, but you, you know. Well, I just, it's because the story you're telling, it's more, it's not that they knew for years. Eventually, we got to give it to this Hayek guy. It was rather we want to give it to Gunnar Myrtle. Yes. And so how do we balance it? Exactly. Okay. That's, that's and it's very, it's very interesting. There's a photograph. I've actually posted it on Facebook once or twice uh, of that Nobel meeting uh, of the awards mm -hmm. in 1974. And it's the king of Sweden giving the belated Nobel Prize in literature to uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. and, and sitting in one of the front rows watching this is Hayek. And he's smiling and he's applauding. And two rows behind that is Gunnar Myrdal with the most <laughs> sour puss look on his face that you could imagine. <laughs> That's great. Well, on that too, I've seen, I'm going to botch the exact joke, but it's like people making fun of economics and saying only in economics can, you know, the same year, one guy get the award for saying socialism works and one guy getting for saying socialism doesn't work or something like that. So it's to, you know, to prove that it's not really a science is, is, the, right. is the claim. Okay, so I inter inter interrupted you there. So back to but the conference. So IHS yeah. was the actual sponsor of the conference? Yes. Okay. Yes, they, they paid people their travel expenses. Mm -hmm. They arranged for this hotel. It was arranged by a, an economist named Ed Dolan. Okay. He actually ended up editing that the volume of those lectures delivered by Kersner, Rothbard, and Lachman called The Modern Foundations of Austrian Economics that mm -hmm. came out two years later in 1976. Um, and then what, one of the attendees was uh, Gerald O'Driscoll. And Gerald either had just finished or was about to finish his own PhD at uh, UCLA out in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did his dissertation on Hayek with uh, Thomas Sowell and I think maybe Armin Alchin, but I remember Thomas Sowell on his committee. And then since he wrote that the same year that the new the Modern Foundations book came out, 1976, the same publisher put out uh, uh, Jerry's book called uh, "Economics as a Coordination Problem," and so that 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 so now you have these papers delivered by the remaining leading Austrian economists at that time, and then Jerry's you know exposition, particularly of of, uh, of uh, Hayek on monetary and business cycle theory, and then the knowledge coordination things, and 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 that helped make people aware of 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 you know the possibility of this a reborn Austrian school. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, well, well, actually one last thing. So how did you, yeah. did you know about the conference and have to apply to IHS and say, can you sponsor me as an attendee? How did that work? No, well, what happened was, is that like I mentioned about in 1972, uh, some friends of mine introduced me to Boldy Harper. They took me down to the IHS headquarter. Mm hmm and so I met Boldy Harper, a man named Ken Templeton, and another fellow named George Pearson. Uh, uh, Pearson was working, I believe, already for the Koch Foundation. Uh, and the Koch Foundation was being already very supportive of IHS. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, 1973, I, I don't know, Boldy passed away. 
So what were they going to do with IHS without the founder president there? And uh, uh, Charles Koch uh, decided to basically keep trying to re- keep it alive. And George Pearson and especially Ken Templeton, who was sort of like an acting on-site president, mm-hmm. uh, were running IHS for all intents and purposes. And um, I had gone down and talked with them a couple of times but, uh, after I met Baldy. And, I'm, and they had my contact information. They must have just remembered me mm-hmm. as this young kid who's, I was 74, uh, 24 years old. Uh, Very interesting the idea seemed to have read a lot on his own and one day I was living in Sacramento My undergraduate degree is from California State University, Sacramento Uh, One day I'm I'm just get this letter in my home mail right snail mail back then and it's an invitation to attend the conference and they'll Cover my travel expenses, but it turned out the travel expenses wasn't enough for an airline ticket Uh so I went from Sacramento, California to South Wellington, Vermont by Greyhound bus Wow Three days going, three days coming, which was an interesting. But I never took that trip. Like yeah, that. I never took a trip. Well, like it's that like trip. traveling to Mecca for you, right? So, <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> okay, so let me. I, I know my listeners know a lot about Rothbard. They probably know something about Kersner, but I, we don't hear too many people talking about Ludwig Lachman. So, can you just you know give the thumbnail version of like what 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 perspective did he bring to the to all of this? Sure. Uh, Ludwig Lachmann uh, was born in around 1902, if I remember. Uh, and he had his own, uh, he had a master's degree from the University of Berlin. And um, he had studied under the rather well-known German historicist, Werner Zumbart. I believe Zumbart was his, th- his master's thesis advisor. Uh, but he was very interested in the history of economic ideas and there was another economist who was a few years older than him who offered to tutor him through uh, some of the classic literature of economics. Now, that was uh, a German economist, Emil Cowder, uh, who is probably best known because he wrote a book called The History of Marginal Utility Theory that came out in 1965. Mm-hmm. And it is a, a very good book and is one of the few from that period that is sympathetic to the Austrians. He devotes a lot of time to the Austrians. Uh, including intergenerational Austrians, that is, between the two world wars, that most are not usually talked about. Uh, and so from a counter, he, 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 was, he was led through the marginalist literature, and he, he that way became himself, Lachman, greatly taken by the Austrians, Menger, Bambavert, Wieser, and others. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Lachman was Jewish, so when Hitler rose to power in early 1933, it was clear he wasn't going to be able to stay there. And he showed the intelligence and foresight to leave. And he went to England and went to study at the London School of Economics and earned a second master's degree studying under F.A. In fact, you can find his master's thesis in the archives of the London School of Economics. And it is on Austrian business cycle theory, secondary depression, Mm -hmm. uh, on secondary depressions. Um, and I probably somewhere in a file might have a photocopy of it, which I haven't looked at for decades, but, but, but that got him interested. And what would most attracted him in this was capital theory, the Austrian theory of capital. So he taught, um, at the university of Hull for a while in England, but he, he ended up during the forties, uh, being offered a job at the University of Weidwaterstrand in South Africa, which is where he migrated. And he remained there virtually his entire professional career. Uh, and what he did there, he was writing articles, uh, both in uh, places like e- Economica, the Economic Journal, and the South African Journal of Economics, on these issues of capital, capital substitutability, capital complementarity, capital structure, um, and uh, then in 1956, he wrote, published a book called Capital and Its Structure. Uh, now, uh, Israel Kersner had at some point got into correspondence with Glockman. And so in 1976, uh, Israel got funding uh, from the Koch Foundation and some other sources, I believe, to begin the graduate program in Austrian economics at NYU, which uh, uh, someone who I kind of vaguely recall might have even studied as part of it at some point. 
Uh, but the, the name is, is yeah. that's at the tip of my He hasn't mind. done much, so it's uh, unforgivable. But, uh, <laughs> but because of that, Israel decided to bring over uh, Lachman, because he was like, like semi-retired from Weik Rodestrand, mm-hmm. to come over at least one term, uh, one semester a year to lecture at NYU as part of the Austrian program. And I was studying there at that time. So I took courses from you know, Ludwig Lachman, um, uh, I, I, uh, as did uh, name, some names that our, our, your viewers may, may recognize. Don Lavoy, mm-hmm. who helped found the Austrian program at George Mason University, uh, Jack High, um, and a number of others. And so, so, um, so as, as a result of this, uh, 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 Lachman was coming to NYU regularly teaching courses. Um, I, I took several of them. Uh, and uh, he aroused this interest in, in the idea of, of focusing on, on disequilibrium processes of the marketplace. His approach has been very controversial. Is, does the market have a, you know, always sort of tend towards coordination? Is it always sort of spilling over and becoming a new discoordination? One can have different views about that overarching tendency of the market. But his writings on these issues, and particularly how he relates it to changing capital structures, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has to be viewed from an Austrian pr- perspective, insightful and very thought-provoking, right. a useful catalyst for your own you know, f- development of your thinking on it. Uh, and he also was a very personal and, and delightful person. I, he, I, I would, he would love to get, for people, the students to come to his office. I would go into his office. He would close the door. And again, in his gravelly sing-song voice, he said, very, uh, Mr. Everling, uh, here in these four words, we can speak our mind. <laughs> and he would tell you about, you know, the Keynesians of the 1930s and, and, and strategies to, like, bring a success to Austrian economics in the four walls. Very conspiratorial. <laughs> well, that's great. Speaking of that, I was going to ask, ironically, is and maybe I'm just misremembering this because because for my dissertation is on capital and interest theory. So I you know read a lot of his stuff and he was sympathetic to GLS Shackle, wasn't he? And who like had a an interpretation of kid like, oh forget the ISLM stuff. The thing in Keynes is, you know, the open endedness and the financial markets are unbounded and da 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 and he he had known Shackle mm-hmm. when they were graduate students together at at uh, London School of Economics. You you see Shackle had, had, had gotten a scholarship. He was a young boy to go to LSE. And he got there about the time that Hayek arrived in 1931 and 32. And he was very drawn to uh, Hayek's ideas. Uh, but while he was working on his own master's thesis, he read Keynes's The Treatise on Money. Mm-hmm. Right? This was obviously several years before Keynes rewrote a different book, The General Theory. And uh, uh, see, I met uh, Shackle. I did an interview with him that became one of the issues of the old Austrian economic news. Oh, wow, okay. Split. I don't think I realized that. Uh, yeah, 1982, 81. I, I think you can find it in the old okay, issues. I'll look it up. Anyway, uh, it, it, uh, the Mises Institute would have those in their uh, downloadable things, I mm-hmm. think. But anyway, um, uh, he, he, Shackle told me that in the middle of writing his dissertation about Hayek, he got attracted to Keynes. Uh, with the with the treatise on money, and sheepishly he he asked Hayek, would, "Would you mind if, if instead I wrote about Keynes?" And he said that Hayek was so gracious and gentlemanly that he said, "You should write on what inspires your interests." And so he wrote more on Keynes than Hayek in in the thesis, and he he said that Hayek again was was gracious and helpful in in, in you know his recommendations mm-hmm. and suggestions leading up to its acceptance as a for, for the master's degree. Huh, that's really interesting. But, but that meant that they see Lachman w- was there and, and knew. Now, um, Shackle saw Keynes as someone who was breaking out of the bonds of general equilibrium theory with his emphasis on expectations and, and dynamic uncertainty. And this led him to, to have his own interpretation of Keynes, which even Many Keynesians don't share. It's not mm-hmm. as if his is the you know the, the the mainline version of Keynesian economics. It certainly is not. But because of the Austrian emphasis on dynamics and process and imperfect knowledge, 
for some reason, and how, how do you understand what, you know, what, why a certain idea clicks in anyone's mind? Uh, Lachman became enamored with that. Um, and he, he especially, though not exclusively, uh, Lock, uh, Shackle's book, which came out in 1972, Epi- Epistemics and Economics. Uh, it's, it, is, it is actually a brilliant, biting critique of general equilibrium theory. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't agree with all of his conclusions or every bit of the reasoning by which he approaches his own conclusions, it's a devastating critique of the assumptions and premises and presumed uh, inescapable logic of, 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 of mainstream general equilibrium theory. You, you can't take that away from Shackle in that book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that meant that, that Lachman then began to have his own views about kaleidic worlds. Right, right. Um, so it, among other things that you, well, let me just ask you this because I want to bring it up. And it's, it's funny, I wasn't setting you up as a test there, but I think the l- viewers and listeners saw, I just, you didn't know ahead of time I was going to ask you about him. And it, <laughs> you didn't just say, oh yeah, Lachman wrote about this one thing, like you were giving us the, the bio- biography of him. So I just noticed like when you would teach history of economic thought at Hillsdale, you would just walk in without notes and just start telling us, oh, this guy was born on this date. So my question is like, have you noticed like you just have a really good memory? Like, have you noticed that in your life that huh, I seem to be blessed with this talent? Yeah, you know, you know it's, a, it's a hard thing to explain. Uh, you know, maybe when, you know, it's sort of like the person who loves baseball or football and they can tell you every mm-hmm. game that was played by any team and the sc- point, scores and who got what points and is that, how can anybody remember all that minutia? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I, I just always found this fascinating and I read it. And obviously over the years, I would also reread a lot of things. So like embedded in it, mm-hmm. but all these other details, they just somehow stuck with me, uh, you know, dates, you know, histories of how a person, I always find the biographies interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for example, um, last February, that is February of 2019. Uh, I write a weekly article for the American Institute for Economic Research, which we were going to be talking about. Right. But right. anyway, um, And for my article back in February of 2019, that third week of February, I didn't write my own article. I did a translation uh, from German. I I can read German fairly well. And I did a translation of of, of Friedrich von Wieser's memorial essay on Karl Menger shortly after Menger died. And I just find those things fascinating because he explains what it was like for him and Bombardier to be students together and trying to grapple with how economics really works. And they were in the dark. And then they come across Menger's book uh, from 1871, you know, the, his marginalist contribution mm-hmm. book. And, and, and it was like opening the doors. And, 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 and they said, it, and, and then the book left, book left unsolved problems. It was like a grand master who set up an intricate chess problem. And you know there's an answer, and he's given you the keys, and he's left it to you to finish the plays on the board mm-hmm. for the rest of the development of this new economics. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I mean just, it just he's per, he talks about how what Menger was like as a person. I, I just find those things interesting. Yo, definitely. And that essay by Wieser about Menger had never been in English, so I did that. Oh, okay, that's great. So yes, you're right. Uh, I did tell you in the beginning when I emailed you. So your your article is. The recent one that caught my attention was, um, what's the exact title here? Paul Krugman's Ad Hominem Defense of Central Banking. Yes. So as you know, I'm not a huge fan of Paul Krugman myself. Uh, <laughs> so what, what's, what, what are you doing in this article? What's, what, where well, is they, well uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Krugman, uh, sh- shockingly, he, he, he challenges uh, – one of the people who uh, Trump had had nominated to be on the Federal Reserve Board, uh, who is an advocate of the gold standard. And uh, rather than proceed to logically and reasonably argue, everyone has a right to their own perspective and try to justify it, right? Mm-hmm. Rather than rationally and logically saying, oh, we, we, you know, it would be uh, uh, undesirable to have this person on the Federal Reserve Board who advocates a gold standard because this is the shortcomings of the gold standard. This is where it has not worked in the past. Uh, the, 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 this is why we need a, 
uh, a more flexible, you know, fiat or paper money system. That would be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Reason your argument as to why you think someone advocating the gold standard would be a wrong fit for the Federal Reserve. Fair enough. But instead, he goes into these ad hominem attacks. They're ignorant, they're backwards. Uh, no reputable economist has, has would ever hold this view. Uh, so basically, if you believe in the gold standard, you're a moron and an idiot. Anyone would be a moron and an idiot. And uh, what I try to show is au contraire, that advocacy of the gold standard on reasonable, logical, and, and, and historical institutional grounds have been advocated by some of the most respected economists in the history of economics. And I, I choose three of them. I, I, I choose David Ricardo, uh, most famous for uh, international trade theory, comparative advantage and explanation of international division of labor. John Stuart Mill, who certainly has credentials both as a reputable economist and a, a political philosopher, his famous essay on liberty. Mm -hmm. And then Francis A. Walker, uh, who that name probably doesn't ring a bell as much, but in the in the in the uh, last decades of the 19th century, uh, Francis A. Walker uh, was one of the most highly respected and regarded uh, economists in the United States. He'd been a general in the Civil War, the Union side. Uh, he, he he wrote on monetary issues. He wrote on the wage question. He wrote a, a treatise called Political Economy which became a widely used economic textbook. Uh, and he too was a strong proponent of the gold standard. And primarily they argued this for, for, for two reasons. I'm obviously summarizing a huge literature, right, right. Robert, and I know you know most of this literature, if not all of it, as well as me uh, or others. Uh, there was the idea that, 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 that money was inherently uh, uh, an institution that had evolved out of the market itself. Uh, maybe not as formally developed about the evolution of m money out of the market the way Menger did, but all the, many of the classical economists had that general idea. Uh, and that the problem is, is that, uh, and, and markets had chosen gold and silver for the most part, though many things had been used as money looking across many societies and civilizations throughout history. Uh, but, th but, but that governments are always looking for more wealth to seize and siphon off from the population. Uh, not only, but particularly during times of war, to feed the war chests of governments. And that uh, what, 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 once, once governments are able to institutionally, either formally or de facto, gain control of the monetary system, either by having a, a, a de jure, an in fact, or a de facto central bank, they can get those central banks to print banknotes that are supposed to represent deposited gold in huge quantities and inflate and destroy the currency and, and, and threaten the, the, the financial solvency of the financial markets uh, with an inability to any way redeem these amount of banknotes put into circulation, given the official ratio of exchange with, with the gold that people have deposited with those institutions. And so that, that uh, David Ricardo uh, wrote a famous, uh, The High Price of Bullion, 1811, mm -hmm. 1812. Uh, in, in which he, he said, I, I think I can demonstrate that the only cause for the inflation going on is that the Bank of England has become a printing press for the government. And all these notes have been printed and the pound has fallen in value. And one indicator of it is the value of the pound on foreign exchange markets. Uh, the, the, and then, then, then if you, and he said, the only way you can ever control this is to make sure that banks must redeem their notes for specie on demand at a fixed rate. Because during Britain's war with Napoleon's, the late 18th and early 19th century, uh, the British government had issued the Restriction Act, freeing the Bank of England from having to redeem notes. They now had a paper currency that could be increased in any quantity. And then the same thing applies to, to John Stuart Mill. And I was quoting from his uh, famous Principles of Political Economy book, which was also a widely read textbook at that time. Uh, and, and that was uh, basically that that again, history has shown that, that nothing is, is, is more dangerous than putting the hands of, of money into the government hands and that the market has its own checks and balances through the supply and demand for gold and the uses of gold for, for money versus other commercial purposes to, to assure a relatively stable value of the medium exchange through which we all do our transactions with each other. 
And, and then, then Francis Walker uh, does the same thing. I'm not going to repeat the same. Mark makes the same cases. But he, he makes a distinguish between two things, uh, market money and political money. Mm -hmm. uh, market money is the money that just comes out of the market itself. Political money is a monetary system controlled by the government, which means disaster. And I should just mention here, so, since many may never have heard of uh, uh, Francis Walker, his father was a famous economist, Amasa Walker who was a strong advocate of, of, uh, of gold as money and even free banking to some extent. And you might find this interesting, is that sometime for one year in the 1850s, a massa walker taught at Hillsdale College. Oh, wow. <laughs> so Francis Walker's dad, a massa, taught at Hillsdale College for one year, and I think it was like 1852 or 1853. Huh, okay. Well, that, that is interesting. Um, the other thing, because I, I recently did something on... Uh, I did like a brief history of the gold standard for this booklet I'm doing for the Mises Institute. And what was interesting to me is reading some of these firsthand accounts and how like even the major power, like in like, you know, Winston Churchill was the head of the exchequer going, having Britain go back on the gold standard after the first world war. And like, it was sort of like everybody knew, okay, we went off this gold to print money to finance the war effort. And, you know, they thought they had to do it, but they all agreed that was really bad. Let's not do that again. You know, like we need, like in other words, right. the the way modern apologists of fiat money talk about it, it's like, oh, we, you know, we went off gold because we saw we could manage it and whatever. And that's just an ancient, but at the time, the people who had seen both of it, like, you know, who who had grown up on the classical gold standard and saw how that worked and then abandoned it to, you know, for the, what they thought was an inevitable or necessity, you know, they they want they thought they had to go back because oh yeah that was that was awful we we had no mooring I mean the currency wasn't tied to anything how could you live Correct. like that Correct the the the, the only problem um, was was the institutional decision <clears throat> at what ratio of exchange to reestablish redemption they had inflated the currency dramatically there was a lot of all these you know pound notes out in circulation now and the only way they could re return to a a gold back currency that was redeemed uh, with the old ratio of exchange was to contract the money, the, 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 mm -hmm. the currency supply. And uh, given the fact that during the, the war and in the early 20s, unions had become stronger, it meant bringing about a fight with a lot of special interest groups who were not willing to accept wage flexibility, even though after all wages and prices gone down with working there's always mon micro non-neutrality effects. It, it would have been no worse off, more or less, for everybody. But the resistance to that is what caused this problem. And by the way, uh, the Austrians understood that even before that. For example, uh, in 1892, Karl Menger was on the Austrian Currency Commission that was formally planning the process of putting the Austro-Hungarian Empire on a gold standard. And he gave testimony there. Uh, Bumbavrik, by the way, was the co-chairman of that commission. Hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and, and Menger says is that uh, what you need to do is to uh, basically don't issue any more currency and wait a period of time views as the ratio of exchange between the then existing currency and uh, let's say an ounce or a unit of gold and use that as the benchmark at which you, re you, you formally instit institute legal redemption. Because, you know, it may not be perfect, but the market would be telling you what it judges, mm -hmm. you know, a reasonable exchange ratio between units of currency and a unit of gold as, as a base, rather, rather than trying to, to artificially, you know, you first, well, as Mises says himself, if you've driven your car forward and run over a person, you don't make him much better if, if you then run over him going backwards. Right. If you cause all these non-neutral and just sort of effects with a monetary expansion, you're going to have a lot of non-neutral distorted effects if you then understood, under, undertake a monetary contraction. Right. The, 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 it, it isn't a painless, you know, macro changes if nothing is, is being affected at the micro level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, the last thing I did want to give you a chance to talk about is you had a book that came out was it, was it last year? The, the four yes, it came out of just about a year ago, okay. in August of uh, 2019. It's called For New Liberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it's published by the American Institute for Economic Research. Mm -hmm. uh, 
It, it can be uh, downloaded off Amazon, both as a paperback book, which I sell, think sells for like 1995 or something like that. And it's also available in a, a Kindle version for just a couple of bucks. Um, and what I try to do with this uh, is that, um, how can I put it? Okay, liberalism has two problems. Uh, liberalism has the problem that many people who are free market or limited government oriented think that liberalism means the Democratic Party. Because liberalism has come to mean that, particularly, especially since uh, the, uh, the 1930s, right? New Deal liberalism. When, of course, liberalism in the 19th and early 20th century meant a philosophy of individual liberty, free markets, uh, rule of law, uh, limited constitutional government. What today goes under the name of classical liberalism or even libertarianism. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is, is, is that um, because of this, many people who, who should view themselves as liberals, rightly understood, have chosen to back away from that. The name was stolen and others don't want to use it. But what I try to do in the book is I try to re reawaken an appreciation and understanding of what true liberalism is the moral foundations of it, the notion of rights in it, the nature of its economic significance. I have several chapters explaining the logic and workings of a truly free market in the liberal tradition using the Austrian framework uh, as the basis in, in, in that exposition, criticizing the Keynesian and the interventionist perspectives. Um, and, and, and then I deal with a whole series of separate you know, so policy issues, including education. Uh, but I also take to task in several chapters uh, the rise of political correctness, identity politics, uh, 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 cancel culture uh, things, uh, 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 to show that, that these are a reversion to an extremely dangerous tribal collectivism. That if, it, if they were to triumph, it truly would be the, the end of a free society in any way grounded in an economic and political individualism uh, that respected the autonomy of persons to freely live their lives in and voluntarily associate with their neighbors. Uh, and then I have some closing chapters in which I elaborate more on this. And I also explain some of the history of, of the evolution of the ideas of liberalism, particularly in the 19th century and the American spirit of liberty in the 19th century. Okay, good stuff. So I will, uh, so folks, We'll put links to the things we've been talking about as well as to Richard's book. Go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 147. I know, Richard, you've got to run. So thanks for the time you spent with us and thanks for everything you've done for Austrian economics. Hey, it's my pleasure. And thank you for having me on, Robert. And I would just want to close by telling the listeners, Bob was in my classes, as he said at Hillsdale College. He was a good one, a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. Take care. Okay, Bye. so long, Richard. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.